All right. Uh, oh, great. So Stopping as Success, also known as SAS, is a collaborative learning project between CDA, Peace Direct, and Search for Common Ground. We are specifically interested in learning what the ingredients of a responsible INGO transition are and how to work closely with organizations um, that are transitioning so the development sector can be led by and in deep partnership with local organizations and leaders. Um, the first SAS program from 2017 to 2020 was funded by the USAID um, Office of Local Sustainability. We conducted 20 case studies in 13 countries of responsible INGO transitions, and we developed 25 plus tools and resources um, to support organizations going through transition processes, all of which can be found on, um, on the SAS website, which Jen will be putting in the chat. I'm really pleased to share that we have recently been awarded a four-year grant by USAID's um, Local Faith and Transformative Partnerships Hub to continue this learning effort. So we hope you'll continue to follow this work um, with the hashtags and the social media links that Jen will be putting in the chat as well as on the SAS website. Today, I'm grateful to be able to introduce our four amazing panelists. Uh, for time, I'm shortening their bios and only sort of sharing one sentence, which does not do justice to the amazing people that they are. So Jen will be putting their, their bios in the chat so you have access to, to all, all of it, but I'm just gonna be saying sort of a short piece. So Pauline Mombetti is the Managing Director of Neuro Kenya. She has invested over 15 years in community development in Kenya, and she believes in not waiting for other people to make change for us, but to make change ourselves. Tala Batista is a member of the Sumatra First Nation in Kalinga, Philippines. She serves as the uh, a Chief Operations Officer for Peace Builders Community Incorporated and Senior Vice President of Coffee for Peace. She is also currently serving as an adjunct faculty for the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding at Eastern Mennonite University. Kashiti Gala is a senior strategist at Plum Insights, where she leads the development practice and works closely with Indian CSOs, governments, and INGOs. She is a visiting faculty for business ethics, research methodology, uh, macroeconomics, and development economics at the Narsi Manji Institute of Management Studies in Mumbai, India. And last but not least, we have David Yamron, who is a senior consultant on the statistics, evidence, and accountability team with Oxford Policy Management. So panelists, with that, um, let's get started. And it's really nice to see um, those of you who are attending to sort of be introducing yourselves in the chat. So we, we welcome that as you, um, as you get to meet each other as well. Okay, so panelists with that, let's get started. Uh, let's to kick us off, you know, please feel free to unmute yourselves, introduce yourselves um, and share a bit about how you're connected with Stopping as Success. And of course, if you brought your favorite tea or something to the chat, feel free to share with us. Um, Pauline, maybe we can get started with you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Grace. I am Pauline Wambeti. I'm Managing Director for Nuru Kenya, which is a local organization that was privileged to be part of the Stopping a Success case study. And uh, yes, today I brought some tea to this meeting. I'm taking Kenyan tea, which is a, a latte because it has milk. And it's herbal with some spices from a place called Koriema, which is in Baringo County. Thank you. Thank you, Pauline. That sounds delicious. <laughs> All right, Kashiti, I see you've unmuted. Hi, everyone. I'm Kshiti. I've been an independent research consultant for the SAS project. And I've uh, co-authored two chapters in their wonderful book, What Transformation Takes. So I urge all of you to definitely give it a read. So yeah, I conducted the fieldwork in India, helped document the case studies of a successful transition for two organizations, Action Aid Association India and Plan India. Uh, I'd just like to extend a big shout out to my co-author, Kylie Bernard Webster, Webster, who's here, who's one of the participants here, as well as Adrian Monteith Wondok. I'm having a warm masala chai, so with ginger, cinnamon, and uh, lots of spices. So the SAS project for me has been an opportunity as a young researcher to make my voice heard in the global north and the international development agenda, so to speak. Thanks. Thank you, Kishiti. Tala, would you like to go next? 
Yeah. Hi, my name is Tala, and I am with Coffee for Peace and Peace Builders Community. How we are connected to SAS, someone knocked on our gate and asked if they can interview us because our name has been dropped by their interviewees. And so we said, absolutely. And we shared many cups of coffee and it has been a beautiful journey ever since. And I'm drinking coffee. It's not coffee for peace, unfortunately, but it is bought by a friend who I love very much and that makes the coffee really wonderful. Amazing. Thank you, Tala. And David, last but not least. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> I'm David Yamra. Uh, my favorite tea is also coffee. Tala. So. <laughs> Very good. Um, so uh, before my, uh, I started a new role at Oxford Policy Management, I worked on uh, Search for Common Ground as a researcher on the Stopping a Success program. And so I co-authored um, the Nuru Kenya case study. Um, that Pauline was such an important part of, uh, as well as a case in, uh, in Timor-Leste with the NGO Bellin. Um, also helped to contribute to a bunch of other great tools and resources from this first Stopping a Success project, which I encourage everybody to check out on stoppingasuccess.org. Great, thank you, David. And thank you all uh, for introducing yourselves. I'm really excited to jump into our conversation. So, you know, each of you are a part of uh, or have worked directly with local organizations through SAS that have transitioned um, from an INGO. Uh, so as a part of sort of a framing of this conversation to sort of kick us off, um, it would be really lovely if each of you could um, share a bit about the transition process um, your organization went through or that you documented in a SAS case study. Um, um, and just some of the, the top lessons learned within that transition process. And feel free to just unmute yourselves and, and jump in. Okay, I'll go first. Nuru Kenya uh, was part of this study because we went through a transition. And uh, this is because the organization when it was set up in the year 2008 of September, the, actually the expatriate team from the United States is the one that was implementing and uh, they worked alongside uh, our co-founder, the late Philip, and they were communicating to the Kenyan team all along that they're going to be able to transition their projects back to the community. So the rationale for setting up the organization was to work with the community to address the challenges of extreme poverty and uh, empower the community to lift themselves out of uh, generational poverty. So they set up in a remote community that is located in the southwestern part of Kenya along the, the Kenya-Tanzania border. And at the time, the community was experiencing challenges of food security. There was uh, health challenges where infant mortality and uh, pregnant mothers were not accessing quality health care. So there was a lot of uh, infant and child mortality. The health infrastructure was not good. And so even health seeking behavior was quite low because the community was not informed. There were challenges of even the community members accessing uh, funding opportunities to improve their livelihoods. They could not access credit because basically they did not have a uh, reliable or stable income. And uh, this is a community that was still holding on to a lot of cultural practices. There was uh, armed cattle wrestling that was continuing. So we had ethnic tensions and uh, school dropout was quite high. It is a polygamous community where girls will get married off at a very young age after undergoing their rights of passage or female genital cutting. So it was a lot of challenges that they were experiencing. And so even in, in education, they were really performing poorly as compared to other parts of the country. So there were four impact programs. They were called impact programs because they were designed to achieve impact as fast as possible to address those challenges through agriculture for food security, healthcare for, to address the health challenges, financial inclusion to inculcate a savings culture and uh, support the community to transition or translate their surplus yield into income 
and uh, the education program that was addressing uh, the literacy levels so that they could raise the standards. And with agriculture, the project was designed to support the community to embrace modern farming techniques. So the expatriate team uh, was able to set up this project and work with the community all through 2013 when they had planned to depart and throughout they would communicate their intention. But unfortunately, their departure was delayed by another two years, they left in 2015. And during this process of transition, the Kenyan team and the, also the expatriate team was able to go through a lot of uh, joint planning, rigorous training of the local team. And this process was set out to be gradual. And so when we were part of the case study, when we were reflecting on what worked well and the challenges that we encountered, we came up with uh, the major lessons that we learned that communication is key and communication or, uh, should really be closely monitored at all levels. Because uh, at some point, one challenge the organization experienced was that when the expatriate team left, the local community felt like the, the, the organization, Nuru Kenya, was collapsing and it was transitioning to an outsider because the person who was taking over was not coming from the community, was a woman, and uh, this was deemed to be a a masculine role. So there was need for a lot of dialogue with the community for acceptance and ownership. And then accountability is another lesson we, we learned that it has to be both ways. The, uh, the organization must be held accountable by the community and the community also needs to be held accountable by the organization because each of them has a mandate to deliver because these projects cannot be just undertaken by the staff. The, community also needs to own the intervention because it's addressing, the interventions are addressing the challenges they themselves are facing. Then there was need to have, uh, to allow room for innovation, experimentation, and even are not going to be cast on stone. There is need to change and evolve solutions because social problems are very dynamic. And then they need to let go and relinquish control. Just the same way the expatriate team relinquished control of resources and decision-making to the local team, then the local team also needs, needed to invite the community to also ensure that the organization is also gradually relinquishing control and decision-making to the community because they know best how to go about addressing those issues as, as long as they are empowered. So those are some of the top lessons that uh, we were able to document through, but our case study is quite elaborate on uh, how we, our transition took place. And uh, I'll beg to stop there. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Pauline. I feel our countries are uh, so different, but context can be so similar. I'm just going to pick up on that thread and uh, continue very succinctly a few learnings for Action Aid Association when it transitioned to Action Aid India. Uh, started working a lot more on social and ec ecological justice for marginalized communities, uh, as well as Plan International when it transitioned to Plan India. Uh, the, the outcome was that these organizations were able to reach out to more than 25 states in India, to union territories as well. So their outreach increased a lot. Uh, just to set the context, a transition from an INGO to a national level NGO to a national entity or a local body is not just something that happens on paper. That was the key lesson that was learned. It's a larger process. It's a psychological process of understanding that the ownership of the development programs as well as the outcomes is now local. It has to be a bottom-up approach towards development. So uh, what, what, what we saw for both these organizations is a drastic programmatic shift and uh, what do I mean by a programmatic shift? So earlier, the focus was more on just disbursing the funds and making sure that it reaches the beneficiaries of development. However, post a transition, a key lesson that was learned that you get to have a greater say, you, have a, you get to have a greater say at the table in terms of your negotiation power when you do become a national entity. 
So just some quick lessons there. Uh, communicating the need for a transition. Why is a national entity important? Right? Because in India, we're working in a context where foreign aid is looked at with a lot of suspicion. What's the hidden agenda? So why is a transition important? Giving it a positive narrative of change is, was extremely crucial. And that, as Pauline mentioned, you know, along with accountability, communication really drove that change. It gave the process a lot of credibility and communication, not just with the employees or the people of Action Aid India, as well as Plan India, also with partner organizations. Why are we doing this? How is it going to change the purpose of our existence? So uh, we'll elaborate on a few more points later, but I just want to second what Pauline said with respect to greater accountability and the need for clear communication in the transition. Thank you, Kshiti. Tala, David, anything to add from, from your experiences? Yeah. Oh, did you just unmute me? No, go ahead. <laughs> the perils of internet, huh? <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I'm uh, again, I'm with Coffee for Peace and Peace Builders Community. How we got connected with SAS or how are we chosen for SAS, as I have mentioned before, um, Farzana, that's the, the name of the one who did the research on us, sent us an email and knocked on our door and said, hey, you have been mentioned by these people I've been interviewing. Can you be interviewed? And that's how we ended up on SAS. <laughs> so, um, Transition. I think for our for our organization, Peace Builders Community and Coffee for Peace, transition is not just an outcome or a part of a program. Transition is based on a whole worldview. And for us, because um, we are from uh, we are our organization is from a Judeo Christian worldview, it is based on shalom or peace. And a summary of that is that peace is harmony with the creator, with the being, with others, and with creation. So that's where transition is anchored. The second one is that the concept of transition is embedded from the start, both in the organization and in the communities we work with. So when we do like programs, it takes into consideration our history as a deeply colonized country and the impact that colonization is still working among our people. So with that, we, well, we start and we focus on relationship building. And so their stories are the foundation of the programs that are developed. And then it also impacts the way we do reports, the monitoring and evaluation. So as an organization, we do not have a distinct phase of transitioning because from the start, it's already the local communities who are leading. And so there's really not that, oh, we need to transition now. No, from the start, it's already there. They, the, the people who are most impacted by whatever we are doing is already leading. Actually, the programs that are already developed comes from them, comes from their stories and from what uh, from what do they have, which means it takes a long time. And I actually remember the very first time I I started in community work and I was assigned in a province and I was asking my mentor, like, what do I do? And then my mentor just told me in that organization, just listen. <laughs> listen for what? <laughs> just listen. <laughs> and so for four months, that's what I did. I just because I don't know what else to do. I just poured their coffee and help, help, help put their laundry on the line or help do their rounds or help walk to their farms, whatever they were doing. And from them, that's when I learned, oh, so that's what listening was. Because then I learned, I learned how they saw the world, how they view the world, how they understand the world. And from then, from there, that's where we dialogue. All right, what do we dream now? What do we envision now? So each community has a different focus. Although we have we have our own we have our own expertise, but it's not immediately that. It, it it really begins with the stories of the communities. And so transition 
the concept of transition is also evident or is also done in all levels of the organization. So our organization, vis-a-vis -vis our relationship with our international Mennonite partners, how do we engage with them? Um, as our, our, our organization um, engaging with the local communities, how do we engage with them? And of course, our organization also internally, like Coffee for Peace is a social enterprise. Who owns it? Like, how is it run? So all these things, all these concepts of local leadership, sustainability are all talked in all those levels and not just and not just organization to local communities. So yeah, so we'll be, uh, we'll be talking more about this later, I think in the question and answer, so. David. <laughs> Thanks, Tyler. Yeah, I think one of the really cool things about stopping a success um, is I think a vision of a, a different or a presentation of sort of a, a different conception of how that aid system can work. And I think what we've heard from, uh, from the first three panelists really, really shows that in some interesting and innovative ways. And then the case study that I'm going to highlight right now, uh, I think does that as well. Um, so I worked with the NGO Bellin in Timor Less. Um, to document their experience transitioning from uh, an international consortium uh, in a USA project, uh, which was led by the Columbia uh, International Center for Con uh, Conflict Resolution, uh, which is now defunct, uh, was a great organization. And the, the Bell and International co-founders like to emphasize uh, a couple things about how they came to Timor Less. The first, and what they see as the most important, was that they were invited. It wasn't a situation where Colombia um, sort of entered the country in order to win grants and funding. It was, uh, it was a direct invitation from a Nobel Prize winner, uh, Jose Ramos Horta, who helped lead the peace process in Timor Leste in the late 90s. Um, and the second thing they like to emphasize is that Bellin started with a relationship. There was that relationship between, um, between Jose and between um, the Columbia staff members that really drove the creation of this, this really innovative and interesting peace building NGO called Bellum, which um, sort of the, the seeds, the seeds of it were in that invitation and in that relationship. Um, and following that invitation, the international staff um, moved to Timor Last, moved to Timor Last, and spent five years meeting people, building relationships, understanding the country, learning the language, embedding themselves in the community, and then starting this NGO as co-founders with the international staff that would ultimately um, lead the organization and still run it to this day. There's a ton of great lessons, I think, that emerged from the Bellin case study. Um, but the one that I think I'll, I'll emphasize most right now is from that story, which is that entrance matters just as much as exit. If we're talking about transition and we're talking about sustainability, then that kind of open-minded exploration, um, that relationship-based, uh, not grant or not contract or not funding-based model of development um, is what really drove the creation of this sustainable organization that has now been around for uh, almost 20 years oh, now driven um, and run completely by uh, Tim Marie's staff um, as the preeminent peace building organization in Timor Leste. So yeah, there's lots more to talk about, but I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Um, I've been around SAS a long time and I still always love to hear um, what you all have to say and, and just more about the, the transitions themselves. So thank you, thank you. Um, so, you know, one of the things that a lot of you have alluded to is the role of sustainability um, throughout transition processes and sort of how to, to make sure that it happens at the beginning, what goes into it at the end and in post transition. And one of the things that I'd really like to, to focus on, because I know it comes up in all of the research that you all have done, is um, the role of financial sustainability. Uh, and I know that it means something different in all of your context and in all of the stories. And um, would love to hear from, from you all, whoever wants to share about what would you say the most critical aspect of financial sustainability 
is within responsible transitions and also um, especially when we think about the end goal being local leadership um, authentic and accountable partnerships financial sustainability like yeah just would love to hear some of your thoughts about um, yeah financial sustainability in this context Uh, yeah, I wanted to start by saying, uh, you know, the question on financial sustainability really gets to the heart of it, because uh, where does the money come from that really determines where the power lies, and it also lays the ground for the distribution of power. So what's happened so far is that when you have any kind of a development program, the distribution of power is very, very uh, unequal. I'm the donor and this is a beneficiary and we dictate the terms, right? Tala spoke about listening. A lot of organizations talk about how donors just don't listen to what local priorities are. So just a brief context on India, we have something known as the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act, which has been constantly amended over the years. So what this FCRA essentially does is uh, it shrinks the space for civil society organizations to be able to get foreign funding on causes that they want to work on. Yeah. So what has happened in India is over the years for some of the most crucial kind of work, which is thematically in two areas. One is for environmental conservation and the second is for human rights preservation, right? So human rights organizations like Amnesty International have been asked to shut their offices in India owing to FCRE regulations. Even Greenpeace has been asked to do that. So national legislation can also determine how financial sustainability works at the national level. So overall, I would say that in the Indian context, the movement is more towards fund your own initiatives, have more locally grown initiatives for funding because you have philanthropists, you have high net worth individuals who should be able to put the money where the mouth is, right? And fund these in initiatives and development, uh, you know, practices that international organizations cannot do. So India has a huge space that is growing for nationals, Indian nationals to be able to fund developmental initiatives. And with that, they get to have a greater say. So if I contribute to greater funding, then I can say that I want to work on advocacy and not on something as banal as, you know, education and giving books to a child. So I'll just start off the conversation there, but money determines the distribution of power, which is why if, if organizations want to fully transition, they must have their own fundraising models. They must be able to have local and national support and belief in their programs rather than relying on international funding, which is always uh, something that is questionable. Thank you. Tala, did you have something to add? I know you unmuted. And <laughs> but thank you, Shikshini. Like, um, I would like to uh, jump on that or, or uh, yeah, just follow that on the issue of power and sustainability and financial sustainability. I totally agree with that. Like, who holds the, like, who holds the money? And again, this takes me back to the worldviews, to, to how do we see it? And so um, first, just I will just tell you a story first on how we on how we relate with, with local communities first as an organization. Um, one of uh, one of my coworkers were telling me in, in, in one of my interviews with her for my thesis, she's saying, you know what? I noticed when organizations go to local communities, they always see what's not there. They see that the people do not have good houses. They see that the people do not have money. They see that the people do not have toilets. They see that the people do not have this, do not have this, do not have this. 
they do not see what they have, what these people have. And it's such a beautiful reminder, like, yeah, if you go to a local community, what do you see? Do you see what they have? Because if you only see what they don't have, then they will just totally color the way you do your development work, the way you do your peace building. So when we go to communities, yes, we acknowledge all those what's not what's not there. We acknowledge that we acknowledge that there is lack of financial resources. But when when we actually take the time to listen and then we say, okay, how can we partner together? In trainings, just a very, very uh, specific example. In trainings, we do not bring them to hotels. They offer their kitchen, they offer their porch, they offer under the trees. We, have, we do trainings a lot under the trees. And then they bring their food, they bring what their vegetables, they bring their chicken, they bring their papaya, they bring their bananas, they bring their snails, you know? And, and, and it's such a beautiful, a beautiful reminder for both of us that these people, have sustainability already in them. Maybe the way we see it is not the way we define it. And so second, when we engage with our international partners who have money, who have, who have financial sustainability, who according to the capitalistic, capitalistic worldview has money, we have to remind ourselves, especially because we come from a deeply colonized country who always see ourselves as who, who, who mostly like whose colonized worldview always thinks of us as lacking. We have to keep on reminding ourselves we are not beggars. That we have that power, that inherent power that values those resources, those his, the our ancestors, the land that we are stewards of. We have that. Third, to our to international partners who have the money. Well, let's go back to history. What made you rich? What made you have that capital? Maybe, maybe what made your country rich, maybe what made your identity rich is on the backs of so many people who are oppressed all over the world. Backs of slaves, backs of colonized people, backs of many plantation workers, backs of very oppressive economic practices. Let's deal with that. Let's face that. And then let's talk. Because we have in like, I really feel that to heal, we have to face this very uncomfortable facts like my internal healing is I, I see it like it's so it's so intertwined. Like, if we truly want this, then let's, let's face that very hard, very uncomfortable history that we share. And then we can talk about sustainability. So yeah. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you, Kshiti. Yeah, Pauline, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I'll just uh, <clears throat> build up or not. Uh, my two colleagues have indicated that uh, financial sustainability, when it is contextualized, it takes shape depending on uh, the prevailing conditions. And it's always important to look at the bigger picture and uh, focus on financial sustainability, especially in our experience from the point of the community and not just the NGO, because uh, we had uh, our expatriate-led intervention being transitioned to the local team. And that meant that we were not just focusing on leadership and governance sustainability, we were also looking at financial sustainability. But then uh, there, there is a trade-off. When you want to have an organization that is sustainable, on the other hand, you want a community that is also financially sustainable. So we were forced to look at it from the perspective of the that smallholder farmer, how are they going to sustain themselves financially so that they can break that generational cycle of poverty? And that is what led us to even uh, transitioning our intervention from reaching farmers in informal groups into reaching them in uh, legally recognized entities 
that can negotiate in the financial space, and then looking at the livelihoods they're engaging in and building the, their capacity so that they engage in profitable livelihoods. And we have got to the place where we are now working to add value to those uh, processes of production. So as we look at across the crop and dairy value chain, we are adding value in that we are building the capacity of the farmer-led organizations to actually invest the little they have, like Tala said, look at what they have, not just what they don't have, and then empower them and build their capacity to continue to regenerate the investment you're making in them and the investment they're also bringing in. So we've come up with social enterprises that are uh, providing a sustainable market for their produce. And that is how at Nuru Kenya, we decided to approach the issue of financial sustainability. First, let's focus on the community. As much as we want to be financially sustainable as an NGO, we exist to ensure that uh, we are reaching our farmers with sustainable interventions. So we have to, to look at both perspectives and decide which one we are going to invest in. And we feel the more we focus on the farmer and the community, then the more relevant we are. Yeah, thank you, Pauline. I don't know, David, if there's anything you want to add. If not, I'll, I'll move us along. Sure, just really quickly. Oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead, Tal. Were you going to say something? No, there is a question in chat. I just wanted to. Yeah, How thank you, Tal. Yeah, we're we're good. I think maybe we're adding all of the um, the questions to to a document that we'll sort of go through maybe in the next five minutes or so. So go ahead, David. Sure. Um, sort of building on what my other panelists have been saying, I think um, this theme of financial sustainability emerged uh, pretty quickly uh, during SAS research as, as important, but it was interesting how it was very differently defined across a lot of contexts. INGOs would typically define financial sustainability as uh, an organization, you know, if a country office um, closes or, or if a project ends, then financial sustainability would typically be defined as a, some sort of new organization emerging uh, led by uh, the former local staff of that office or that project. Um, but I think what we found in a lot of other cases was that that definition didn't necessarily jive with, with a lot of people. And that the question we started asking ourselves was, well, sustainability of what? Like, what are we really talking about sustaining here? Are we talking about another NGO? Um, or are we talking about sustainability of, of outcomes and what and how communities define quote unquote development outcomes or what success looks like to, to people on the ground. Um, and I think that was a question that we wrestled with a lot at, at Stopping the Success. And I think um, what, what Pauline and what Tala and what Kishiti have, have laid out is a really important reminder uh, for those of us uh, in the IGO community that, you know, it's not, it's not always about creating another IGO. Uh, it's about focusing on, um, the outcomes that are desired by by the people involved. So, yeah, I thought that was uh, that was really cool. Yeah, thank you, thank you all. Um, so we have like a few more minutes before we want to transition to our Q and A portion, but I want to make sure and, and give those of you who would like to just share a little bit about um, this theme of leadership that comes up so often again and again, and how it's both you know the the leadership of the organization that has resulted throughout the transition, um, but also the leadership of um, of the person or the group of people that have led the transition process. Uh, and so just wanted to give those of you who would like to share just briefly about um, uh, what, what do you think is needed to build a strong identity rooted in the community and rooted in the context during and after a transition process. So I don't know if there's one or two of you that wanna share a little bit about the role of leadership um, in one way or the other. I want to quickly add a couple of cents on uh, leadership. I think, so the representation and who the leader is, is it's not just a matter of ticking a box at the national level. Their, their context, their ethnicity, 
uh, what position is the leader coming from, you know, whose rights are they representing becomes very, very important in terms of setting the agenda and the programmatic focus as well. So, for example, having someone who's from outside the country head that particular organization changes the dynamic fundamentally because the lived realities are very different. At the same time, there are very clear examples of INGOs supporting locally groomed leaders. Now here, we're not talking about leaders who may be fluent in English, can you know, necessarily have a Zoom conversation, but they have the in indigenous knowledge. You know, uh, we've seen so many women-led organizations and self-help groups with women who might have studied till the fourth or the fifth standard showcase the power of community by mobilizing the other women in their remote rural villages. So when you have a national leader with that kind of a vision in mind for the organization, they're able to groom and support leadership at, at the at the very grassroots, right? And those are the kind of catalysts, the change agents, really the movers of the development agenda that you need. Those who have years and years of experiential community knowledge who will understand and point to the right challenges and really question authority and uh, speak truths to power. So I think the question of leadership is more around trust and honesty in who is leading the organization, but also the leader in belie believing in decentralizing their own leadership to create many more leaders within the country at a very local level. Just building on that really great point. Uh, in the in the Bellin case study that I mentioned earlier, one of the really interesting uh, leadership models, well, their interesting leadership model was um, what they call the senior management team. And the basic theory was that no one is irreplaceable. Uh, I think we, we saw and documented a lot of cases of transitions where local organizations uh, had one leader uh, who centralized power, uh, which can be really good in some cases um, because it's, there's often a really passionate person who wants to take forward the, the, the work of you know, the, the, the IGO or the project or whatever was, was carrying on. Um, but that, that creates sort of fault lines in the organization um, because when that person leaves or you know, gets sick, suddenly the organization is left leader. And what Bella did is sort of prepared for that possibility and inculcated this uh, ethos of democratic organizational governance. So every decision that was taken by the NGO was debated, discussed, and, and agreed by consensus within a uh, you know, five-person senior management team. And that allowed this sort of wider participation um, apart from the, the director, that sort of decentralized decision-making allowed everyone to participate build their own leadership skills and sort of prepare the way um, and allowed them to, um, to, to sustain themselves beyond what, what might have been a really rough leadership transition when the first leader left. Um, and so I think that story um, was really inspiring. Um, yeah. Thank you, David and Katie. Um, a quick one, I think I'll, I'll just talk about organizational leadership and then and then engaging with leadership in commun in local communities we work with. So uh, so first with the organizational leadership, when when the organ when Peace Builders Community was started, um, the founders were very uh, intentional in making sure that the board is composed of the people they work with, like of the people who welcome them in. And then within the leadership right now, or within the organization right now, there is a very intentional mentorship program for all the interns who come in and for all the second generation um, leaders coming in. And so, and so we have so we have like we have very intensive uh, mentorship in 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 all aspects of of uh, of our life, of our being. And then usually our mentor focuses on our weakest parts. <laughs> or like, like what I've been saying, harmony with the creator, with the being, with others, and with creation. 
<laughs> so that's that's the framework. And so um, and then also there is always this what I appreciate about that that model is the freedom that even if yes, we are giving you all the time, we are giving you mentoring as much as we can. You are not tied to this organization. And if you choose to go, bless you like all our blessings. We will write you the best. Um, what do you call that when you are applying for a job and you they ask you references? We will give you the best references. We will bless you. And I think that's a beautiful way of leadership because my mentor always tells us they're not actually gone. They're actually, it's like a dandelion seed who goes to another place and shares the whole vision and the whole vision for peace and shares the whole enthusiasm. And so the more that you get out, it's actually better. And I think that really taught me on leadership of not claiming it, but on releasing it. And so, and so, so that's the organizational model of leadership. The second one with the communities we engage with is again because we are from a Judeo-Christian framework where like we are always invited when we go to communities and then at the same time we look for the person of peace. So what does a person of peace look like? Someone who welcomes us <laughs> to their houses, someone who will feed us, someone like someone who really welcomes us and from there and from there we just uh, from from that person we that person usually opens up many, many doors in the communities. And usually that person is very gentle with their leadership. Like someone who would delegate, someone who would stop, someone who would be so free with their leadership. That, that's usually my experience with a person of peace. They're usually not closed. They would also be very, very open. And so, and then uh, couple it with, uh, I will borrow Ella Baker's um, leadership model, like everyone has a role, even the person in mink. So beautiful. And so, and so in, in all, in, in, in all uh, programs, there is just not one person doing it. Like there is a person who has that, uh, who has that uh, passion for it. So there might there must be a person whose passion is planting. There is one person whose passion is networking. There is someone whose passion is uh, uh, coordinating. And so and so just and so just um, again, it all ties to listening. You will not know these people if you don't listen to to who they are. So yeah, that's it. Thank you, Tala. And I think I'm going to start to open it up for questions. I realize we, it's always amazing how much faster these, these conversations go than we plan. So let's open it up for some questions. I know some have come through in the chat. So I'm going to start us there. And then, of course, if you have more, um, continue to put them in the chat. We're also available beyond the scope of this conversation. So we'd love to continue to be in conversation with you. Um, the other thing I will say at this stage as well is that if the conversation is really going and we come up to the hour, we're gonna invite you to stay on for maybe 10 more minutes if you have time. We understand if you have to drop off, which is which is completely okay. Um, but if you happen to have a bit more time, we're gonna just sort of stay in conversation with each other um, for, for about 10 more minutes after the hour. Um, so with that, I'm gonna kick us off with just sort of lumping the first few questions together that have come from Dr. Moki. Um, really that, that talk about the local community communities and somewhere or the other. So there's sort of three that I'm going to try to loop together and feel free to sort of take them apart as makes sense for you all. Um, but the first question is, um, are local communities informed of long term financial contribution so that they can plan early? Um, in addition to local communities carrying um, food to eat, do they also donate to the program um, for sale? I assume this is for you, Tala, maybe speaking about Coffee for Pieces model. Um, so thinking about that role and then also, um, are there some situations where communities donate time to the organizations to run some income generating activities to cater for the overhead costs? Um, so yeah, maybe Tala, we can start with you and then if others have places to jump in as well, we can go from there. Yes. Um, so, so for again, whoever um, our our model is, however you have the capacity for. So yeah, people sometimes will donate money for food. Um, that's for trainings. But um, regarding the donating of money for programs, yes, 
And also, our focus is more on social enterprise. Coffee for Peace is a for-profit social enterprise, and it was created because of the peace-building work of peace builders community. Like people are saying, how can we talk about peace if our stomachs are hungry? And, and, so, and so one of the ways to address that is to build a social enterprise, which means, okay, how, what do you have in your hand that we can turn into a social enterprise? And so, yes, there's sometimes people would put money into a program that they want to, like, for example, relief organizations, like, oh, relief aid. People in the community have, have also money to give. And also, we, uh, we encourage people to, to invest in their own social enterprise. So for example, buying, buying, coffee for, uh, buying coffee seeds so that they can start their own plants. And I think I will, I will answer this later because I saw another question. But so, so, it's, uh, so basically, it's two-way. Yes, they donate money for programs if they want to. And two is that we encourage them to invest in social enterprise that they can that they have already in their community or that they can form within their community most usually it's coffee because that's our expertise i would say for us thank you tala for us it's basically all about uh, encouraging the community to invest in their own interventions and uh, we are working with farmers organized into cooperatives. Those are farmer-led organizations in our context. And we encourage them to invest in their entities. So they are not only investing the time, as we also invest in building their leadership and governance capability. And we invest time in ensuring they acquire skills on business modeling and financial modeling and uh, bookkeeping, financial management which involves a lot of uh, knowledge on bookkeeping. So the farmers will come into their own entities. They're committing themselves. They are creating time to learn these concepts. We are not paying them. We are not giving them any allowances. They, it's them creating time to learn this and then modeling their own financial ideas. And we just provide that expertise and advice whenever it is needed. So I'd say out of these models, they are able to have viable business ideas that can meet their overheads. Because uh, when we start the intervention with them in the formative stages, we will second staff to these organizations, but gradually we withdraw and draw down our support to them. So they are able to meet their own overheads. So it's a symbiotic relationship where they are meeting their own costs and needs they are addressing the challenges they're encountering, and we are there to anchor as an anchor to support and provide that capacity that is necessary. Again, I would uh, say that uh, for Nuru, we are challenging ourselves to create leaders because these farmers have to make decisions for their entities, and these decisions have to be sound. So they have to be able to spend their resources in a prudent way. So this is something that we have to inculcate through the leadership program, which recently transitioned into an institute. Amazing. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you, Tala. Um, so I'm recognizing we're coming up to the hour. I think we are going to stay on. We have another question directly for Tala. And then also I have one about the impact of COVID-19 on, um, on both this topic, but also just local leadership more broadly, responsible transition. So would love to spend a bit of time thinking about that as all of the SAS case studies were conducted prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. And so would love to just spend a little bit of time reflecting on that um, in this moment that we're in. But before that, I want to make sure we have time to answer the questions that were in the chat as um, uh, respect for, for all of you who were in attendance. So understanding that if you have to jump off, please do. If not, we encourage you to stay on for 10 more minutes um, to discuss the role of COVID-19 um, on this on this conversation. So before we transition us there, um, I will ask, there's a question to you, Tala, about um, please to share more about the partnership between Coffee for Peace and the community. Um, uh, is Coffee for Peace the coffee provider. Um, oh no, sorry, is the community the provider to the, the organization? What is the form of Coffee for Peace contributions to peace building and economic stability um, and resilience of the community? Thank you so much, Sri. 
um, for, for this and thank you, uh, Grace. So um, for the first question, the partnership, as I have mentioned before, Coffee for Peace is born out of the peace building are the peace building work of Peace Builders Community or PBCI. I'll just say PBCI and CFP so that it's shorter. Um, and so the PBCI is the one who that engages with the communities, like uh, the one that's doing community organizing, um, trainings, everything like uh, all the trainings and usually the trainings we have. The formal trainings are six months, but the informal, the informal engagement can last up to whatever the community tells us. So it can be up to 10 years, three years, one year. It really depends. Actually, some are just wanting trainings, and that's also fine. It really depends on the community's uh, need and wants for us to engage with. So it's PBCI who does the trainings and everything that, uh, that makes it possible. Coffee for Peace buys the coffee from the farmers at a fair trade price. So, so that's the direct, uh, the direct, um, direct help that Coffee for Peace does. We are a ready market, but usually in our experience, after we train them, a lot of farm, a lot of traders are already there. We'll come buy them. And because we also train them on negotiating, we train them on pricing, we train them on, 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 on the whole coffee value chain. And usually after our training, they don't lack for buyers. <laughs> so, so whether or not coffee for four pieces, there someone will buy their coffee. So, 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 that, uh, so that's, the, that's the huge uh, part of it. So, so what, how does it help in peace building and economic uh, sustainability and resilience? In the Philippines, most of the peace issues is poverty, like lack of food security, lack of uh, how to bring, how to send their children to school. So those are the peace issues. So uh, having an alternative to armed violence that can provide these needs is already a peace solution. Second, because of the way, because of Coffee for Peace um, model in business, Coffee for Peace is uh, CFP is invited to um, both government and corporate uh, meetings on how to on how to do on how to make the coffee value chain fairer, both nationally and regionally. So in a way, so in 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 this in these aspects, Coffee for Peace helps in helps in the national and regional level. Of making cof the coffee value chain fairer for the farmers, so so that's uh, the second one uh, that it helps in um, economic sustainability. So we can say that it's like we have like this cake in the Philippines, bibingka, bottom up and top down. It's both. Amazing, thank you, Tala. And so for our last question today, um, I'm also going to bring in a question that we had come through in the chat. Um, would just love to hear um, those of you who want to share about um, how COVID-19 has affected um, responsible transitions. Perhaps it's your organizations personally, uh, any of this sort of lens around sustainability that you want to share, um, as well as local leadership more, more broadly. We also had a question come through about in light of all of this, right, the, the fund the restrictions on funding, um, the pandemic, um, how have you seen communities sustain themselves? And if people aren't able to support financially, how are ways that, that we can be in solidarity together and, and be part of the change? Um, yeah, so maybe we'll, we'll end on that note, though I see a few more questions coming through, so I hope that we can exchange emails and contact information, but, um, but maybe for the last question, yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts. I just wanted to like share a few thoughts on the situation in India. I think uh, um, would like to acknowledge what we are going through as a country and uh, also say that I come from a relative position of privilege for sure to be able to be uh, literally like living in India every day. I'm like grateful to be alive. I think it's come to that. So we've had uh, officially we've had more than uh, 250,000 deaths. However, there's various, uh, you know, I mean, reports that are clearly talking about the extent to which the numbers are being understated. 
uh, would just also like to go on record to say that there, there's been a complete government failure with respect to anticipating what needed to be done and being able to do it on the go. Right. So uh, what we see and the two, interestingly, the two topics we've been talking about, financial sustainability and local leadership, is what is the need of the hour. So how communities are surviving is based on civil society. We've seen civil society come to the rescue because our government machinery has not been able to match up, right? So uh, even in the kind of vaccine diplomacy that we've had as one of the largest manufacturers of vaccines in the world, we've been exporting them and not been able to procure enough for you know, our country. So I would say that, um, I mean, in the Indian context, we've had misplaced priorities with respect to electoral agendas, with respect to allowing for religious mass gatherings. Uh, and at the same time, there is a se severe crisis of livelihoods. Uh, it's, it's not, I mean, lives and livelihoods are both, uh, you know, deteriorating as we speak. So I think what has been really uh, a ray of hope in all of this is the power of individuals and communities and organizations. So uh, to the student who posted, I would really say that there's multiple ways of contributing of which I would say time, talent and treasure. If we count treasure as, as money, you still have your time and your talent, right? So uh, volunteering for various organizations, there's COVID activity action groups that even I'm a part of, where even reaching out to families in need, verifying needs, leads and helping out is uh, proving out to be life-saving in some cases. So I just want to say that uh, in the current crisis, uh, I mean, this is a time when actually India needs a lot of international uh, support as well as intervention to be critical because we have a government that is in denial mode and we have media as uh, that has not been able to challenge it enough so and this is only because every life counts at the end of the day it's it's really not about uh, politics anymore so i would i would just want to say that the role of transitions in this case has to be to let local authorities have the power and have the say but also be able to speak and criticize when things go wrong Right? when things are clearly when there's a humanitarian and a health crisis at play uh, where I would say that there's too little being done too late so yeah that's uh, <laughs> would have liked to ha end on a slightly more hopeful note but I just want to say that the collective trauma that Indians especially those who do not have the means to survive right now are going through that trauma and those stories have not come out yet and we will see them in the time to come uh, when there are I mean anecdotes if not numbers to verify them. Yeah. So. yeah thank you for sharing that deeply personal um, reflection it's it's sitting heavy with me as I can imagine with others and just yeah sending you lots of deep solidarity. Um, thank you for sharing. Are there any, la yeah, Pauline, I see you've unmuted. Do you wanna perhaps maybe have our last word? Yes, I would like to say in our context, especially because we are working in a rural area that is quite remote, we've had to really uh, look at how to continue with our interventions despite the COVID-19. And this has led to us embracing technology, introducing uh, computer packages for the farmers so that they're able to be at least part of uh, uh, the digital, digital digitalization that is happening because we have, uh, we have to reach them with messages. So we've encouraged uh, our partners to support us to sponsor uh, radio shows because at least this help us to reach farmers with messages. We are working with farmers who are in dairy production and uh, animal disease control is quite important. And uh, the field visits have really been hampered by the movement restrictions due to the pandemic. So you find the farmer is always, always tuning into the radio show, knows the time when we shall be airing a certain episode and at least they can keep themselves informed of any outbreaks or what they need to avoid. So 
uh, we've had uh, some of the partners sponsoring our talk shows. We've also had, uh, an, we have an SMS platform that we are trying to revamp so that we can use that to push messages to the farmers so that they are able to keep themselves also informed of the changing on emerging issues and the changing trends. And then we are looking at ensuring as many farmers are, as possible are able to become literate, computer literate, because that way they can also keep tabs on what their portfolio, how their portfolios are performing. We have online platforms that they use to track their investment and we've linked this to the local bank. And so it is important now for the farmers themselves to start uh, analyzing their information then and uh, being able to make decisions despite the fact that we cannot no longer hold those meetings. So I think uh, that is something that we have realized we need to change the way we are delivering the intervention and build the resilience of the farmers so that they can also continue to embrace technology in the light of this pandemic. Thank you, Pauline, uh, and thank you to all of you um, for joining us and also to all of our wonderful panelists for sharing with us today. Uh, we're at time, so I'm going to wrap us up um, and just want to, yeah, thank again all of you for joining us. I know that there have been lots of people um, who have called in who have been a part of the SAS program in some way or the other, and so we're really grateful to continue learning alongside of you. And for those who are new to SAS, um, we're really excited that now we are in community together and we've been we've been connected so thank you thank you for joining us um, so as i said you know sas is on the the verge of, of an additional four-year award and so we hope that you'll continue to stay in touch with us um, jen has done a fantastic job thank you so much jen for putting all of the links and Everything you could imagine that that any way to connect with us is, is now in the chat. So please um, have a look at those those resources. Be in touch with us to continue the conversation. My email will also pop up in the chat if if you want to get in touch with us directly. Um, and yeah, just want to thank you all for your time. Continue to to take care and and be well. Um, and yeah, thank you all again for for joining us. We'll chat soon, I'm sure. Thanks, everyone. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. I'm leaving on for a moment <laughs> while everyone is signing off. Thanks for joining us today, everyone. Thank you, Jen. Was the silent person behind the chat. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you were a power woman with, <laughs> with the chat. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just a reminder for everyone who might still be on here, Grace's email address has been dropped in the chat. I will do it one more time. Um, if you have any questions about the event today or would like to ask your remaining questions or get in touch with any of our panelists, you can email Grace first and Grace will make it happen. <laughs> or you can, of course, go to everyone's Twitter and uh, message them directly, but in websites, but you know. <laughs> Thanks, <Jen. laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to close out our uh, Zoom today and just thank you all so much for joining us. Until next time. Thank you. Thanks, David, Tyler, Kashiti, Seth, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Chat soon, I'm sure. Bye. Bye.